Hello and welcome to the webinar on AnyLogix Material Handling Library, Essential Techniques and Functionalities. My name is Arash Mahdavi and I'm your host today. Today, as our guest presenters, we are thrilled to have Tyler Wolf Adam and Jeff Wartz with us. Aside from being a great simulation modeler, you probably know Tyler from previous webinars and the work he put into creating Python connectors for any logic. And you probably remember Jeff from our previous webinar uh, around any logic model manager or any logic cloud. In this webinar, only Tyler and I are going to present, but Jeff is going to be available at the Q&A section. This webinar is going to be a first part of a two-part webinar series about Material Handling Library. And in this one, I'm going to start with an introduction to the Material Handling Library model building workflows and its functionalities at high level. Then Tyler and I are going to go over several how-to models and other example models in our repository of example models to show you different techniques and functionalities um, in regard with material handling library. Uh, I have to mention that in this webinar, we decided to start with uh, the simpler examples, but in the follow-up, the three of us, including Jeff, will also show you more advanced techniques in different uh, sections of this library. In this one, our focus is going to be on conveyor systems and transporters. In the follow-up webinar, we will shift our focus to more advanced conveyor systems and transporters techniques, plus a storage systems and some other uh, pieces of the library that might help you in your projects. This webinar is not going to start from the basics. Uh, because we wanted to cover more practical topics. So we assume that you are familiar with overall model building process in any logic. For example, we assume that you know that the logic of the model is defined through flowchart blocks and the layout through space markups, and then you can create an association between the two. Um, I also assume that you're familiar with creating custom agent types and how you can assign them to flowchart or, or create resource units that are from custom agent types. Um, throughout these webinar, um, since we assume that some of you might have more familiarity with process modeling library or pedestrian library, if there is a chance to draw some analogy between the two, we do that to kind of help you accelerate the learning process. Um, Again, to be clear, this webinar is not going to cover everything about MHL. We are just reviewing some of the fundamental and commonly used features and functionalities um, at high level to, to help you get started. Near the end of this webinar, I will show an overview of other helpful reference materials that can help you to learn more about this. And um, along with this webinar, it will give you all the things you need to know to get ready for the more advanced one that is coming um, soon. The webinar recording and all of these materials will be available to you and we'll send you emails as a follow-up to um, inform you that the, the material is online. Thank you and let's uh, start the webinar. So looking into the material handling library, you will see that there are four main um, type of use cases that are covered by this library. You see conveyor systems, cranes, transporters, and storage systems. Similar to the other libraries in any logic, you are seeing three major sections here. Uh, you have the custom agent types. These are agent types that are specialized with specific APIs to be used with this library. You have a space markup elements, which are drawing elements uh, to create the layout and the physical representation of your um, operation. Or you can see we have the logical blocks here, which are the building blocks of the logic that you put together to represent the flow of things in a flowchart-based modeling approach. The reason that you see process modeling library blocks here is that because as I mentioned, uh, PML, 
blocks work seamlessly and in a complementary fashion with MHL blocks. So we selected some of the commonly used blocks to be accessible here as well. But as a reminder, this is not the full list of the building blocks from PML. You will find the full list here. These are probably the most commonly used or essential ones here to make the model building process easier. Okay, before we start, let's just very briefly go through some of these building blocks and explain them and see what they are. And then we start looking into actual models. So the first two agent types are specialized for this library. They give you more specialized API for both the material and transporters. Resource type is similar to what you find here. So it's a specialized resource type agent, but it is not different from what you find in the PML library. Um, then we will see the space markup to draw conveyors. You see the conveyor pair here. This is where you define the conjunction between a branch conveyor and the primary conveyor. Position on conveyor is when you wanted to define an exact position on the conveyor for different reasons. Here we have transfer table and turntable. These are elements that represent some physical elements in the conveyor system. Transfer table, move the item without changing its orientation. Turntable uh, turns the um, item's orientation toward the next section of the conveyor. We'll see examples of them both. We have stations. Uh, there are two types, regular station or a station and turn station. And this is just a place when some task needs to be done before the items can continue moving on the conveyor. Custom station give you more room in case uh, maybe the, um, the station that the work is being done is not on top of the conveyor. So the elements need to be put on a separate station. Some task needs to be done and they can continue on the conveyor or leave the conveyor system. We have two types of cranes. We have a storage systems. Um, this is kind of analogous to a pallet rack, if you're familiar with that with, uh, in the PML library. Um, and eventually it's gonna be a substitute to that. And eventually the storage would be, a, would be a completely substituting the pallet rack system. So we have lift or elevator, which help you to move uh, things uh, vertically in your model and then you will find some elements to draw paths and nodes, mostly for um, path-guided uh, transporters. Uh, these are kind of the same as what you find in the PML, but they work with transporters as well. And you will also find some space markup elements that are helping us to define some obstacles in the space, for uh, transporters that are moving freely um, in the space and not path guided. Some specialized uh, space markups here, like network port, which help you to have separate conveyor systems or conveyor networks and um, connect them through these ports. So level gate is also another specialized uh, space markup in MHL. As you know, any logic supports multi-level models. And if you have transporters uh, with free space navigation that are moving between different levels, you can use level gate. And density map is another element that is also available in pedestrian library. And again, it helps you to see the density of moving units or transporters in this case, um, when they are uh, following a free space navigation logic. Okay, so now let's uh, take a look into the uh, flowchart blocks. So we have convey, which is the main element in the conveyor system. So you also can see conveyor enter and exit. Conveyor enter is when the agents start interacting with the conveyor network. And if the agent needs to leave the conveyor network and continue as a generic agent, you can use conveyor exit. The next elements, as you see them here, are uh, move by crane, seize crane, release crane, um, and these are working similar to um, all the other elements in any logic when you wanted to do some task and you also need to use some resources. Here you see that there is no kind of logical block that defines the crane themselves as a resource. It's because 
it will be uh, the seas block will be pointing to the actual um, uh, space markup element. That's the kind of a different design in this specific case. Um, you also see the um, transporters. You see uh, transporter fleet, which is the resource pool representing the fleet of transporters. You have move to or move by transporter, similar to move to block in PML library. You have seize and release to use the transporter fleet and release it when you're done. Transporter control adds another layer of customization to things that you can do with the other transporter related blocks um, at global level. And then we have store, retrieve, and storage system blocks, which are the set of blocks that help you to create um, you know, storage and retrieval systems. And as I said, you see a subsection of process modeling library blocks here that are most commonly used, so you can use them easily uh, and accessing them easily from the same library block. Okay, before we start exploring some of the uh, example models that we talked about, let's briefly look into how the workflow of creating these type of models would look like. I'm not going to create a model right now. I will just show you how the uh, model building process would look like. For example, I can, you know, draw conveyors with this. Um, you can zoom in, see it. And you know, add, for example, some of these space markups on top of it. Let's say add a turn station here. Um, looking into these elements, you can see that you can click on each one of them. There are lots of properties that you can set for each element. And the same is true for any space markup that you add. And as you see, the properties is context-based. It's going to be different based on what you're selecting at any point. Um, and aside from that, you have the logical block, which help you to kind of drag and drop and try to create some logic in your model. So, um, and that's the workflow. So you draw your physical representation of uh, the operation and you draw a flow chart that represents the logical flow of things here. So in case of using a specialized um, agent types, um, for example, you can drag and drop these types here and then start creating them. If you're using these, um, if you're using the um, agent creation wizard from the agent palette, just make sure that when you're creating your agent type, please make sure that you come here and select uh, the a specialized uh, version of that agent type. In this case, for example, a material item. And even if you have created a generic agent, let's say you create an agent and you haven't um, assigned it to be a specific type like material item or transporter, you can always go to its properties after the fact and change it to be a specific type. And eventually you're going to make some association between the logical blocks and the space markup. For example, here we have a conveyor. I can say, um, I'm gonna start conveying from the source conveyor and I select this. It's gonna be the beginning of here. And then the destination or convey to would, would be another conveyor, this element. And I can select this and it would be the end of this conveyor. And now I have the logic, the space markup, and the association between the two. That's the generic workflow. And as I said, if you wanted to use your custom agent types, you can create them. Like, let's say, create something um, like as a material item, and you can give it even a specific, you know, shape. You can draw it. You can bring in something from all the elements that we have, 3D or 2D, uh, but I'm gonna just draw a specific, like a rectangle, put it there. And you know, can change the color to whatever we like, say blue. And now we have this element. And when I click source, I'm gonna select that specific or custom agent. And that would be the agent that will be put here. If you need to use that agent's API in the space markup, you need to make sure that you go to the space markup and select 
that specific type so that the this uh, space markup element knows the type of agent that is moving through it is this a specialized material item and then you get access to all of its api so that was the workflow again i was not trying to create a model i just wanted to show you the workflow let's move to some example models and then i will point you to a previous um, uh, webinar that i did and and there there are four example models like tutorials that you can follow step by step and there are other references that i will show you at the end if you wanted to create a model okay i'm gonna start by showing you some examples in the context of conveyor systems and to start with some simple examples to establish you know some of the fundamental ideas i went and opened up three models from the example models, and these are all coming from the how-to models, material handling library section. We'll make sure that you have correct, you know, references to all of these models in the supplemental material that you have access to. But um, let's start with the most basic one, the convey example, which focuses on the convey block itself. Let's open up the main uh, and see what we have here. As we discussed, any logic models that use the layout um, by the help of the uh, space markups, we draw that layout. As you see, we have some conveyor elements, we have position on conveyors, some of these you know, stations, for example, and so on. So you can explore them one by one by clicking on these elements, seeing like what that specific object is. This is a turntable. This is uh, another turntable and these are stations and so on and so forth. And when you select one item on the space markup um, that is a part of a network, you see it, that element specifically. If you click again, you see the entire network that this conveyor element is, is part of. So you see that all of these things, all of them are part of this conveyor network um, that is selected right now. Okay, and as we mentioned, we have your flowchart blocks. Um, in this case, there are two sources that generate the agents or objects or items and put them into the model. And now we wanted to learn how the convey block can help us actually move them around uh, in this environment. Okay, the story behind this is like this. There are um, items that are coming in from here or from this person that put some items on the conveyor on this specific spot on this um, position on conveyor. Um, and they are both, all of these items are moving toward this photo eye. This photo eye is going to um, kind of be the place when we look into the items if it's and, and detect if it's fragile or not. If it's fragile, we need to send it to this branch and it gets to this station to package it uh, properly as it's fragile. If it's a normal one, it goes here and it only takes one second and then eventually all of them will merge into a singular um, path or conveyor and they, they leave the model. So that's, that's what we want to do. So we drew the space markups and we have our convey blocks. So we have two source blocks that generate the agents and put them into the model. Um, if you're familiar with any logic, you know that you can change the agent type to be a specific type. So here we created this agent type called carton. If I go to the model, you see it's here. I can double click, open it. Inside that we have a variable and the initial value of it is, is gonna be a random value. So with the probability of being through 10% uh, of the time meaning that this Boolean value is either false 90% of the time and 10% of the time is going to be true. So it's less likely to be fragile, but there are 10% who are. And um, when we get to this point, we are going to ask each agent or item or carton if that is fragile. If yes, we are going to guide them accordingly. So let's take a look into how the convey block works here. So source blocks are generic um, logic blocks. So they are not telling the agent where they should be. Basically, they just create the object uh, or items. And then 
they they put on the conveyors. One quick thing that I forgot to say is you see these cartons. Um, if I go here and click on this page on top, you see that it is a material item, meaning that it was created from this agent type that is customized for um, being an item and has some specialized API. These sources are gonna create cartons. And then for this one, um, you see that when I click this conveyor from conveyor start, it says it starts from a conveyor and it is the, it, it says that the source conveyor um, is gonna be a conveyor. And the conveyor that it points to is this, the name of this. It's a, it has a generic name, but what it is is actually the conveyor here means this element. So this convey block, which is named from conveyor start, starts these items that are put on it at the beginning of this conveyor block and it conveys them to a position on a conveyor. So there are different options. Here we select position on a conveyor. And then we selected this photo eye as the destination. For the items that are coming from this source, this is representative of this person. And they are gonna immediately show up at this position, right? Um, and then they will be conveyed to another position, which is the photo eye. Basically, both of them are conveying the items to the same photo eye. Here we um, kind of check if this item or the carton that came here is fragile based on that inner variable that we looked into. If it says yes, um, it will get out of this port and it means that it will be sent to this station. You see that the convey block can have different options for convey from and convey to. So convey from could be a conveyor, a position, or a current position because already this item is on a conveyor. So we can say wherever you are from that position, you need to convey to another place. So there are multiple options here too. Could, could be a conveyor, a position, a station, a customer station. Here we are conveying these items to this station, which is the packaging for fragile items. Um, so that's that. So these, if something is fragile, it goes there, spends 10 seconds here and then leave. If it's not, it will go here. So let's see if this is the kind of the false um, output and um, here we go to this conveyor three, end of conveyor three. So what is interesting here in this case is we didn't tell them to go from here to here. We said, you know, you need to go from where you are, current position to the end of this end conveyor. So how is it supposed to know that it needs to get through this location and sits here? So the convey block, the way it works is if you set the um, destination and there are some other stuff happening in between, the item automatically passes through them and do all the tasks along the way. In this case, because we say go from here to the end of this conveyor, the shortest path is going to be here. So it selects this path. And as these items are passing through this path, they get to this station and they take their time, this one second processing time there before they leave. So again, the point of this model was just to show you different ways that you can use the convey block and there are different ways to convey from and convey to. Okay, now that we explain everything, let's take a look at the model running and you can observe this process happening. Um, so things are coming in from this conveyor and this person, and then they will be put here. The cartons are coming from both ways. They go pass through the photo eye. There is a um, unlikely scenario, 10% chance that some of them are fragile and they go to this station. So I can, for, for this source, it works only when I click this button. So it's kind of like manually works. Um, and the cartons have a different color, but you see that kind of every 
here and then you see some packages or cartons that need to are fragile and need to properly package and they go into the other part. Okay, uh, now let's move on to the next model. Okay, the next thing that we wanted to look at is this conveyor enter and it tries to kind of show you how to use the convey conveyor enter block. Okay, let's run this model first to see what's going on and then we'll get back to the logic. So here we have a pallet that is coming in and a sheet and they need to be put together before we can actually put this pallet on the conveyor, right? So there are some tasks that are needed to be happening before this element or item is actually put on the conveyor. So how we do it, we can actually do these things with regular objects and when we are happy with what we have, or there are some tasks that are needed to happen before the conveying kind of task, we can do them all. And then when those tasks are done, we put the ready, the, the item that is ready on the conveyor. So let's take a look at what's happening here. So here we have two sources. One of them is, is using or creating a pallet. So you see it uses the agent type pallet. This is the sheet. You see they have two things. Pallet is uh, this and pallet sheet is this icon. It's just a rectangle, right? So we need to put the sheet on the pallet, okay? So these pallets are coming into the model. There will be a logical queue. Only one of them will pass. Um, and then there is a path from here to this location on conveyor, this path, uh, or as you see here, is not connected to this network. It's not part of the conveyor network. It's just a path to move the agent from here to here. So they are at the kind of a meaningful location. And then at this point, when this item gets to this point, it is ready to be put on the um, conveyor network. And this is where it goes to the conveyor enter. And we are gonna say the entry point is defined as a position on conveyor. There is, we can actually use a conveyor itself, but here we wanted to, to show up in this specific point. Um, and then we selected that kind of position on conveyor as its uh, entry point. Simultaneously, uh, sheets are coming in. Again, a logical queue and a delay block that models the, the movement from here to here. Uh, both of these delay blocks are connected to these uh, paths. And during the model runtime, you will see the elements are moving in these paths. And the amount of time that that movement takes is gonna come from the delay time of these blocks. So eventually both of them are gonna combine here so we need both the pallet and the pallet sheet to be here um, so that we can combine them together and we have the combined element. And then there is a, a secondary convent block that says uh, from the current position, which would be somewhere on this uh, position on the conveyor to the end of this conveyor section. As a recap, what we did here is in scenarios that you need to do some tasks on the agents before um, they are ready to be put on a conveyor network, you do that. And when you're ready, you use the conveyor enter to do um, the next um, task. Okay, let's run the model. You see that these two elements are coming in. And when we have this element ready, we will put it on the conveyor. It waits for the other one to come in, we combine them, and now the combined item is moving to the end of the conveyor. Let's take a look at um, a similar block to conveyor enter, which is called conveyor exit, which help us do the opposite of what we just saw in the previous uh, example. Let's first take a look at the main here. Um, so the idea here is that we have some items that are conveying on or moving on this conveyor. Um, but when, because they are heavy, when they get to the end of this conveyor, they cannot just be uh, moved on their own or 
it, it's hard to pick them up. So we need uh, a forklift to come here and pick them up and then move it to the storage area. So that's what we want to do. Um, when you have a convey block like this, you can say, okay, items that are coming in from this source, we are conveying them uh, from this conveyor from the beginning from here. And then we say that the target is gonna be at the same conveyor, but at the end of that conveyor, right? So from moving from here to here, that's good. But as you can see, there is this um, uh, option here, leave conveyor on exit. And by default, it does not um, check, meaning that when the items get to the end of a conveyor, they don't leave the conveyor. They actually stop here. And if there are more items coming up, they will start to queue up or line up here. Um, and this is what we want it to happen. So we don't want, so we can check this and say when they came there, when they are reaching the end, they fall off. But that's not what you want to do because they need to stay there before this forklift comes in and pick them up. So we ac actually like this behavior. And we say, okay, wait there. After that, we are going to attempt to seize the forklift if it's available from the pool. And if we can actually do that, then the conveyor exit happens. So this conveyor exit is kind of similar to checking this, but instead of doing that here, we wanted to have this middle step or chance to seize the forklift if possible, and then exit the item from the conveyor. So that's the logic. That's why we separated the convey from the conveyor um, exit block here. And the rest are just kind of generic movement and the, the resource comes in, the forklift comes in, pick it up and move to the, to the sorting area. And that's the end of the model. So let's see it in action. So you see that the items are coming in, so let me speed it up. They get to this point, but you will see that this item won't leave on its own. It waits for the forklift to come in. See that they are all waiting. And, you know, so that's the point and we, we clearly managed to model that. So if um, this forklift slow, there will be a big, um, queue of items on the conveyor, which is exactly what we wanted to model here. Okay, the next example that we wanted to look at is pretty simple, but it is very informative. It's, it's called pallet packing line. It shows us a couple of things, including transfer tables and two variation of turn stations. Um, if you remember, there are some elements called tables. We have transfer table, and turntable. Transfer table won't change the orientation of the item that we put on top of it. So it just goes, if it goes like this, it moves like this to the next section without rotating toward the next section. Um, and then we have stations. Um, we have kind of the generic station, which you put uh, on top of a conveyor, or we have turn stations. Uh, here are two examples of turn stations and stations are basically a place on the convey on the conveyors network that we need to do some task on the item and it takes some time uh, but there are different ways of using it and that's what we wanted to show here so we have two simple source blocks um, convey um, you see that the conveyor says uh, you start uh, from conveyor A um, at the beginning from here. This is from the beginning of conveyor B. And they both try to convey the elements to the end of sync conveyor, which is here. So you see that the convey blocks are pretty basic. We just set the kind of the start and end point. And everything else, all the other stuff that are happening along the way are happening because of the space markup. Any logic, deduct the logic and needed tasks from this drawn space markups. Let's, let's take a look at the model as it runs to get some better visualization of how this thing actually looks like. So I speed it up. 
Okay, you see these cartons are coming in. And if you pay attention to this transfer table, you see the orientation of the carton didn't change. Here we have a turntable that turns it several times, um, I think three times, and we'll look at it in a second. And then the next one tries to change the orientation in a way that um, a specific edge of this carton faces toward the scanner, okay? So let's see uh, how we are achieving this. So for the transfer table, it's basically pretty basic. You just add it to your network and it works as expected. But for these two turn stations, we have two different um, rotation mechanics. This one um, rotation is by the given angle. So it's just kind of, we say how many times we want it to rotate, we say four turns. Um, and then we say the speed when the item is moving on top of it, this is the speed that we want it to be. And the rotational speed uh, or RPM is gonna be this like rotation per minute. And there are different ways to calculate that as well. Okay, so that's that we say rotate it four times. And when it gets here, we are using the second option to achieve a specific orientation. And the orientation, if you look here, we have front, left, right, and rear, rear. And you might say, okay, what does it mean, the right orientation for this box? How can I know what right is? If you go to the palette um, description, by default, and this is your like the um, shape that we associated for this, um, the, the animation of this agent type. So you see that the, the default descriptions are like this. This is the front, this is the rear edge, and logically this is gonna be the right. If this is the front, this is the right, and this is the left edge. So when we say rotate it to, to the right, it means that this, this edge should be um, kind of facing the direction of the conveyor at that point. And that is exactly what is happening. So. Let's take a look at it again. I go to the 2D view, speed it up. You see four turns here. When the cartons get to this, regardless of where they are. So here it needs just like a, a little bit of turning toward the scanner. So the actual barcode is facing the scanner. Regardless of what the ori orientation is, going to be, it turns it so that the right edge is facing the scanner. So that's the idea here. Um, and it was very simple. We wanted to, for you to see how the turntable work and also the um, turn stations. Okay, the next model that we want to look at is called reversible conveyor buffer. The idea here is to examine the idea of having a reversible conveyor and how that works with an example. Um, as you can see here, the, um, the space markups are pretty simple. We have one conveyor that is not reversible and this section is. So the space markup elements here are pretty straightforward. We have two conveyor sections. One is not reversible. So you see the more the forward uh, direction with this arrow. This one is reversible. And as you can see, it has two arrows. The white one shows the forward direction. And if you just uncheck that, it's, it's going to be the only one that stays there. Um, and we have a simple like station here and two position on conveyors um, to set some locations. So let's run this model and see what we are trying to do. And then we get back to the actual logic box. So the idea here is that we have the station here that processes four items, uh, sorry, six items. Um, it has capacity for six items. They all need to come in um, and we can start processing them, let's say a few seconds. And then after that, they can leave. But as you see, if this is, um, full, the station is full, we don't want these items to back up on the main conveyor. We want them to go to this 
buffer conveyor. And when uh, the station is done with the process, we want the, this conveyor to reverse its direction and um, let these items to go to the uh, uh, station. So that's the idea behind it. So let's see how we can do this and what actually went into this model. So we have some pallets that are coming in from the source, very simple, and they're all moving toward the sensor. Two sensor is a conveyor block. And as you can see, it, it starts from the beginning of this conveyor block and it goes to the stopping sensor, which is this position on the conveyor. So far, simple. Then we have to make a choice and we need to look into the station, which has a processing time of 20 seconds and capacity of six items. So here we check and we ask this, um, if the station is processing, meaning that all six pallets are in it and it is in that 20 second uh, processing time in the middle of that, something is happening. If we are below six, so it means that the item actually can pass, or if, um, yeah, so the only case that is actually blocking uh, a new item to get in is when the station is in processing. So this question is processing will let us know if we can actually send a new pallet into the station or not. If the answer is no, uh, the, the pallets will get out of this port of this uh, select output. And the rest would be simple, they get out, they get to this um, convey block and they will be conveyed to the end of this convey uh, conveyor um, and space markup. But as we know along the way, they get to see the station. So they will get in here, they wait until like six items or pallets are coming in, they do the processing and they leave. But the interesting part is when actually we are processing, meaning that things are here. Then we go to this um, two buffer, and this is trying to move them to um, this uh, target position on this um, secondary conveyor. But looking here, there are a couple of things that are interesting to know. First, they are not leaving this conveyor. So if when they are coming in, if they get to this end point, they are not leaving. So they are gonna stay there. We also added a delay here like there is just with a capacity of one and it's going to be stop until delay is called, meaning that like the first one that gets there is going to be stuck in this delay until we, we call the stop delay on that. And there will be some that are in the middle of moving to, toward this target position. Let's say that this station is done processing. This 20 seconds have passed and these six items are ready to get out. On process finished, we are going to send a signal um, so that we can release that, it, that item that is in the wait to switch. So you see that we are gonna wait to switch, stop delay for all. Um, and then we are also going to change the direction of the side conveyor. But there is an important caveat here. And that is when we have a conveyor and we are changing its direction and there are some items still on it, um, what happens is those items are going to exit that convey block via this out redirect block. But there is still one small piece that we haven't talked about. Let's say this is the first time that this um, station is blocked, um, meaning that six items are here and a new item comes in and because it is blocked, it moves toward this location. Good, right? But let's say that is that process is done and these items need to go here, meaning that this um, conveyor will change its direction toward north. And because of this, now the direction of the conveyor based on this change direction is upwards. Now we need to think about all the subsequent scenarios when the station is again become full, but this conveyor is the direction is toward the main conveyor. In this select output block, we are going to check the direction and say, if somebody needs to get out and go to this um, buffer conveyor, 
we check the direction and say, if the direction is backward, meaning that it is this way looking north, we need to change the direction to be uh, forward, meaning that it, it looks toward this position on conveyor. So with this, we're gonna fix that. What we are trying to achieve is if the direction of this buffer conveyor has changed because of a previous items that were there and buffered there, we are gonna turn it back to the default, which was looking toward south, when a new item need to use this buffer conveyor. So that's another thing that um, you should consider. So let's run the model once again and see all of these things happening in the model. So items are coming in, they go toward here, nothing is in there. So up to six items can come in, they all get here. Now there is no room. So these are moved toward here. And as you can see this, this conveyor helped us to create a buffer. And one other thing is if you just zoom in, you will see that this arrow actually shows you the current direction of the, um, the conveyor section. So in this model, this is the, the move by transporter model. Here, items will arrive from one of three conveyors where it will request a pickup from one of the available uh, AGVs or the transporters. They'll then go to pick them, the items up, and then deliver it on the respective conveyor that matches the item's uh, color. So in, in this model, it's a, a situation uh, similar in the real world where certain items need to be picked up and delivered using some type of transporter. So that could be an AGV, it could be a, a forklift, uh, or any other of that kind. So similar to the PML's resource pool, the definition of a transporter fleet is in this block that looks like a resource pool block. Uh, and it has some similar settings, such as the capacity and the home locations. Uh, but unique to the transporter fleet itself, you have options such as the path guided or free space. And, and attributes such as the uh, acceleration or deceleration speed. You can add delays for route calculations, uh, et cetera. So there are a variety of different options here. So in the implementation of this, it's done using this move by transporter block, which is the focus of uh, this, this demo model. In this block, you designate what the destination is, whether that's a conveyor, uh, a path, a node, an XYZ location. And then there's also internal attributes for uh, both seizing and releasing with relevant settings like the loading time and the unloading time. And you can also specify more complex uh, preemption policies as well. So if I go ahead and run the model for demonstration. So here we could see items coming in on the, the different conveyors. And once, once they reach the end of the conveyor, it will send a request to one of the transporters who will go pick it up and uh, navigate this path network uh, to the conveyor that matches the item's respective color. So there's a few things to observe here. One is that these space markup elements have properties in it which influence the routing. For example, in this model, there is a section of the path which is unidirectional, it's not bidirectional. So if I flip back to the editor and select the path, you could see that the bi-directional box is unchecked and there are arrows here to indicate that. And you can change that from the context menu if you want. Another thing to observe is that transporters will take the shortest path. So when this transporter picks up this item, it will path find to find the shortest route to the start of this uh, movement. And then there's also built in uh, collision avoidance that we'll see in various uh, parts of the model as two transporters try to interact in the same node. And any logic handles this automatically through some uh, bottleneck detection, and that's handled automatically through some delay. Additionally, as you'll see, when one transporter is dropping off an item, other ones that want to move beyond it are, are waiting in a queue. So this is all customizable features through the, the various different settings that are shown in some of the more uh, advanced how to models. And finally, I want to point out one interesting modeling technique that's that's shown here. 
So despite the fact that there are three incoming conveyors, which are all separated from one another, and six outgoing conveyors, it's condensed into a set of two different blocks. So one to represent the entrance conveyor and one to represent the, the exit. And this is possible because when agents get generated through the source block, they get assigned a random uh, source and target conveyor, which is stored in variables which are part of that item agent type. So if I go ahead and open that up, you can see that there are two variables here, which actually point to the space markup elements, which correspond to those conveyor elements. And then in the settings, it just needs to simply reference the, the variable, which represents that agent's source conveyor. And same with the, the target as well. And there are a few different benefits of this, such that it condenses the logic. Uh, and in this way, we can have just one block to represent the generic operation of the arrival, rather than having to have three different convey blocks for the entrance and six different convey blocks for the exit. And it also makes it easier to figure out what's going on within the model. And another benefit is that it allows us to expand this model in the future if we decide to add more entry points or uh, exit points. So purely as a, a reference, I modified this example model to be able to show what it looks like if you were to so-called flatten uh, this operation. And if I scroll down here and unenable this, so this is the um, same logic that's, that's shown above using the same distributions of which source and target conveyor to use but done so explicitly through these different blocks. So as you can see, it's much cleaner uh, to have this, this method of, of modeling. So in short, uh, this move by transporter model is, is excellent if you're wanting to have a simple reference for how to use this block. So this model that I'll be showing here is the seize transporter and release transporter demo model. And it shows how you can use the dedicated seize transporter and release transporter blocks. Now, if you look inside a move by transporter block, you'll see that there are built-in settings for seizing and releasing. But if you want, you can externalize this to dedicated blocks. And this is useful when you have some intermediate operation uh, between the seizing or releasing and the actual movement of the uh, transporter itself. So if I go ahead and run this, for example, you can see it running. So once the model starts up, the different items seize three transporters, which then move to the target destination. And because of the fact that this first, if I pause it, if this first transporter uh, needs to have its, its item delivered, um, those other ones have to wait behind it. So if I go back to the, if I go back to the logic, you can see that there's this intermediate operation that transporter is waiting for that crane to move uh, that item onto the AGV before it then actually commits to this move to operation. And here, once it reaches its destination, it shouldn't just leave immediately. It should wait until the crane manages to pick the item up and actually move it completely off of the AGV before it's fully released, allowing it to circle back around and, to, and go to, going to serve another order. So with the dedicated season release block, you have more control over this specific sequence of operations that, that happen within the model. And as a final remark, in a previous webinar, we walked through how to build a model that was very similar to this one, and we'll provide some references to that in the supplementary materials. So in contrast to uh, this model, if we go back and take a look at the uh, more simpler move by transporter model, items came into the, uh, the system through this conveyor. Once they reached the end of the conveyor, they then seized uh, the, the transporter. And at that point, the AGV or the transporter goes to pick it up. It then begins its movement operation to its destination. Now, by having the seize, move by, and release all contained within this one block, 
after the seize operation occurs, the AGV has to make its way to that item, which is you know, potentially wasted time or might not align with what the actual operation of your system might be. And so by having it, uh, having the seize operation external, it allows you to first define some operation to occur, like the AGV moving to the uh, pickup location before the actual loading operation happens. When you're creating transporter fleets, there are two different ways that you could set up its navigation, path guided or free space. And this complex model demonstrates uh, transporters being able to move with free space navigation. So with free space navigation, each transporter takes into consideration its current location in addition to its surroundings. So things like obstacles, like the various different conveyors that you have, different walls, whether that's rectangular or you know, polygon-related walls, even pallet racks or, or storage objects are all considered obstacles, uh, and even other AGVs or transporters themselves. They're all obstacles that it will be able to automatically uh, figure out you know, ways around it in a more natural format without having to define different, different paths. Here, I'm not going to focus on the complexities of the logic of how items get between different workshops, but instead I'm going to focus on a few different specific attributes that are relevant to how the uh, HEVs are set up. So one is the fact that there are actually two sets of transporter fleets within this model. There's this one at the top, and this is, has its own number of HEVs, uh, different home locations. It uses a, a special custom agent type called AGV with its own set of maximum speeds and acceleration and deceleration. And then down here, there's another transporter fleet, which is specifically for the part supply process. And this uses a different AGV or a different agent type, which has its own set of uh, attrib attributes here. So in addition to that, you can see that within each transporter fleet, that's where you specify whether you have path guided or free space. So in this way, you could have as many uh, transporter fleets as you have different types of transporters. And depending on the, uh, you know, what the most important aspects to a specific project are, or what the environment is like, the information that you have, uh, or even the AGV or the transporter itself, you could choose whichever, um, you know, type is most most relevant. And What's nice that makes this all possible is that the actual logic that defines the sequence of operations is completely agnostic to whether you choose path guided or free space. So it enables you to fully you know, use the one that, that's most relevant without you know, any extra workarounds in that case. So if I actually run this model just to demonstrate the magic of free, free space transporters, here on the start, you could choose some it's parameterized with the speed and the number of AGVs. We'll just keep that all the same. And so as items are coming in, you could see that the different transporters will move between uh, the source and destinations, avoiding the walls that are in the environment and even themselves or the other AGVs that are around them. What's Convenience uh, and a nice part about this is that if I switch back to the editor to, to show something, uh, similar to the pedestrian library, there's the uh, density map object. And to include that, you just have to find it within the palette and then drag it into your model and optionally have a something like a checkbox if you want to be able to toggle whether that density map is showing or hidden. So if I go back to the running model now, I can check this box and you can see overlaid on it is a, is a density map. And there are a variety of different options that allow you to choose how you want this to be displayed. For example, if, there's, if, you're, if it's set up to show the uh, maximum throughput or the, the mean, or if it's based on a rolling window or cumulative for the entire uh, model run. And so if I advance the model, make it run faster, you could see you know, the various different, different hotspots are. 
Now, one thing I'll point out is that because of the fact that this is free space, those options that you might see uh, in, in other example models that, that deal with things like including or excluding certain paths or areas to, to include in the route, because this is free space, that's no longer relevant. But that also doesn't mean that you can't control or manipulate the, the routing. So, so what you can do is you can add something like a, a rect rectangular node to the model. And here, if you look inside the properties, you can see there's a section for speed and access restrictions. And so you could designate things like within the region made up of this node, we could say that AGVs can only move 0.25 meters per second. And you can also set up access restrictions so that based on things like capacity, for example, uh, like one AGV, like a fixed amount, you can set up throughputs based on a, a schedule even, uh, or a condition, which is dynamic, or even programmatically through uh, close or open function, you can block off areas uh, so that the AGVs can't, can't, or the transporters more generally uh, can't go through that um, zone. And what's another interesting feature is that if you don't have this area as avoided if closed, those AGVs will get up to that node uh, and then wait there until it's open. So something like if there's, if there's a traffic going in a perpendicular direction, they could still choose to move through this area, but they just will, will be stuck there until you know, the pedestrians finish walking through. And then that will then be opened up and then they can continue th this route. With this check though, that will completely block it off and they'll just reroute to navigate around it. So to kind of demo this um, really quickly here, what I can do is, now currently within this model, as we saw when it was running, you could see that AGVs move, you know, between the different workstations from the Southern part of the facility to the Northern part. Uh, if I want just for testing purposes, I can block off all of this section in the middle here, essentially funneling them all through this, you know, narrow path over here. And as part of this, I can add a button just to, to be able to toggle that. But a label T for toggle. And to, let's see, the name is node two. So I'll copy that. And then I'll say if that node two is open, and if I want to, I can also use the uh, code completion for this. So if it's open, then I want to close it. And then in all other cases, which is when it's closed, I want to uh, open access again. So now whenever I click this button, it will either close or open access to this. And I have this checkbox enabled, so they'll reroute to, to avoid this area completely. And just for feedback purposes, I will uh, make it be so that um, if this node two is open, then the node itself will be transparent. Otherwise it'll be something like the Peru color. So now to test this, we will launch the model. As you'll be able to see when HEVs move through this area because I've set up the uh, speed restrictions, they'll be slowed down while they're in this area. Now, in this case, I've set it up statically so that it's, it's always um, gonna slow them down, but you can use the uh, API that's provided to be able to change that in certain events or based on a, a reoccurring event, you can set it up and customize that however you want. So I will speed up the execution so that the AGVs move around the whole facility and we get more of a fleshed out density map. And then at this point, I will press the T to toggle it. You can see it now turns uh, Peru colored to indicate that it's closed. And as I run the model more and more, you'll see how this area 
eventually uh, dissipates. And then the areas over here have more traffic in them. And in this case, it's okay because the things that are uh, happening here are not too intensive to cause a, a problem, but in the, the real world systems, you can you'd be able to test that dynamically if you want. So in short, this transporters moving in free space model, while a bit on the complex side, is uh, an excellent model if you want to see you know, the, the power of these free space uh, transporters. As I promised, I'm going to show you some useful material that you can use to uh, learn more about uh, MHL. Uh, let's start by some of these uh, that are available from our website. If you go to anylogic.com under resources, you will find things like blog posts, videos, books, documentation, and so on. I would say uh, great resources to start with would be going to the documentation, looking into um, library reference guides, and in this case, focusing on the MHL. And here you can enjoy uh, learning from this great reference, and it's very detailed. It walks you through every single aspect of the library. Going back to um, the resources, uh, one webinar that is pretty complementary to what you saw today would be another one that I did a while back. If you go to resources, um, videos, uh, you will find several tabs, go to webinars and demos, and there is this one. Uh, called Fundamentals of the AnyLogic Material Handling Library. If you click on that, it actually takes you to this web page. And aside from the uh, webinar itself, it has some material that you can download. And you can also look into these great blog posts that um, walk you through a different aspect of the library. Another resource that you can look at and learn from is this uh, great model that is created by our friends and partners at Simul AI. Um, here you can get access to it from any logic uh, cloud or the model manager. It has a great interface and it helps you to um, examine different types of model building blocks in this library uh, in a visual format. Thank you for staying with us till the end and let's start the Q&A section. Okay, so thank you everybody for staying with us till the end. Uh, I know we are a little bit over uh, the actual one hour time limit. Um, we really appreciate you staying with us. And there were a ton of great questions. Thank you, Jeff and Tyler, um, for answering them as much as we could uh, in real time. Uh, but there are some questions that are still remaining and we selected some of them that might be useful for the entire um, audience here and we'll go through them if there is anything that is left unanswered we will make sure to answer them in the follow-up material so without further ado let's go through the question um, so I will start by questions that I would answer and then I go to Jeff and Tyler um, so the first one and and by the way I'm going to answer them at very high level these are great questions that you can spend many um, hours on answering them properly, but I'll give you a high level answer to start with. So the first question is, what, uh, what's the difference between setting um, the agent type in the, in the source block versus the space markup? So you probably have seen that you can create a special um, agent type and um, assign it to a source, basically meaning that in your flow chart, you have access to that specific agent type or you can assign it uh, in the space markup elements of the MHL. Um, so it basically is simple as this. If you need to get access to the custom API that belongs to that specific agent type in the flowchart, you need to assign it to the flowchart, let's say source, or if you need to get access to those, to those a special or a specialized uh, APIs in the space markup in the callback uh, fields, uh, make sure that they are selected in the space markup elements. The second question is, what is the difference of um, having custom agent types versus the generic one? So this is again, 
a kind of a high level question in general in any logic. The idea is that you can create these type of hybrid or multi-method models that use flowchart based modeling, but the entities that are passing through the flowchart or your resource units are agents themselves. So at the most basic level, um, the use case of having custom agents would be to differentiate between the objects that are moving in the flowchart or your resource units. Um, for example, you can kind of differentiate between different packages that you are processing, their arrival time, size, priority, color, whatever you want. So that's a simple case, but you can take it to the next level in any logic and actually put a live dynamic model inside each object. And that is true also for your um, resource units, or in this case, for example, transporters, meaning that you can have, for example, a state chart that represents the driver of the forklift or the AGV, or AGV doesn't have a driver, but like a forklift um, or um, a transporter, and you can keep track of, for example, um, how many hours that that person is being uh, um, driven that, that specific machine, or you can keep track of different states of that machine or transporter looking into uh, things like idle, busy, in maintenance, uh, and so on. Okay, so let's move uh, to Jeff. So Jeff, there are two things here. I'm gonna combine them into one. There is one comment and I think another question. So the comment is, please show more rack systems or storage systems in the future. I think you have a good answer for that. And the second thing is, how can we create ASRS uh, in MHL? And by the way, ASRS is, stands for Automated Storage and Retrieval Systems. So Jeff, please. Thanks, Suresh. So we will actually be reviewing this uh, in more detail for the part two of, of this webinar. Uh, but the short answer of it is with the uh, combination of the transporter fleets and the new storage object, you can um, implement these ASRS systems into your MHL models. So let's move on to Tyler. Um, what is the difference between path guided and free space transporters? Um, aren't they aren't them both uh, spatially aware? Mm -hmm. Yes. So good question. So for the the path guided, I mean the name itself is uh, you know gives gives evidence to this. So the path guided transporters are. Uh, restricted to just the paths that you pre-specify, whereas the free space transporters, uh, you define different obstacles like the walls and the and the conveyors, and then there's a built-in uh, path navigating algorithm that's used to be able to to move about the space. They have, when you wanna, uh, like I was saying uh, before, when you want to be able to customize that, uh, there's different ways to do that, whether that's the specific routing whether to include or exclude certain paths or you know, defining things in terms of the uh, area nodes. So they're, they're both uh, spatially aware to a certain degree, um, but the, the free space is more just kind of a continuous process versus the path guided that's kind of focused on moments uh, you know, when there might be a collision. That's when the uh, spatial awareness specifically in that case. Yeah. starts to be considered okay so and the last question uh, can i create a fleet of forklifts with different capacities characteristics like size or speed mm -hmm. yes so like we saw in that in one of the models uh, and, and you'll see this recurring uh, you can have different whether that's the resource pool or transporter fleet for as many different uh, objects as you uh, as you have and then you can, within that, define the number of uh, agents within each resource pool or transporter fleet, in addition to specifying the agent type in which, uh, like agents in, in general, can have their own individual uh, characteristics. Okay, perfect. Thank you again, Tyler and Jeff. Um, again, to reiterate, this is uh, the first part of a two-part series. Um, when we started to recording this, we realized that we wanted to cover a lot of model that does not kind of be done in one webinar. So the follow-up would be more advanced um, uh, scenarios for transporters, um, conveyor systems, and Jeff will cover the storage systems um, with several examples. So 
I, I highly recommend you to, after watching this, join us for the next one. Um, thank you again for spending time with us today and have a great rest of your week. Thank you.